I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I hope I don't f this up. So, the radio's not working. Well, that's not true, the radio component itself is actually working fine, but there's three other aspects about the head unit that aren't. One, the speakers are a little bit janky sounding at times. Two, the display doesn't work, and three, neither does the tape deck. Regarding the first issue, I am running the old factory dash speakers, but the ones in the headrest are brand new. I swapped those out back in part 5 of the main restoration series for the Fiero. But there's still some popping, thumping, and static that's been present, and that's the fault of the actual stereo itself, not the speakers. And if you weren't aware, this is made by Delco, one of GM's favorite part suppliers of years past. They formed all the way back in 1909, but now they cease to exist. Though, don't mix up Delco with AC Delco, previously known as United Delco, which is a different GM subsidiary. It just happened to start off as an amalgamation of many companies, with Delco being one of them, and that's where they derive their name. It's honestly a little confusing, but all you need to know is that this old radio is an old radio. I did a bit of research regarding the unpleasant noises that these units were plagued with, and everything I found pointed toward a faulty amplifier board. Specifically, three capacitors that are prone to leaking. Electrons just start pouring out all over the place inside and that attracts e-bugs and as we all know, those feed off sound waves. It's just not a good time. In my research, I found a technical write-up talking all about these capacitors, as well as a 40 minute video going in depth about the repair. Only one problem though. Those don't apply to me whatsoever. Those three electrolytic capacitors that fail, fail because they are undersized. They have to be very short in order to fit underneath the heatsink for the chips on the amplifier board. These guys right here, as you can see in David's video. But uh, they're not there on mine. My whole board not only has all the components in different locations, but it already makes use of ceramic capacitors. Replacing the electrolytic capacitors with the new ceramic ones is what you do to fix the noise problem. But it looks like Delco already figured that out by the time my board was manufactured. So, besides $2.45 going down the drain because I jumped the gun and bought the replacement capacitors before I even removed the radio from the car, I now also have no idea what the problem could be. The only thing I can really do is just keep looking, I guess. Almost all of these boards have what's called a conformal coating on them. It's just a thin film that's meant to act as a protective layer for the components, which on the amplifier board is red, as you can probably tell. But I noticed that even with this protective layer, there's still a bit of heavy corrosion happening here. Is that what's causing the audio issue? I don't know, but it's probably still not good. For cleaning electronics, a lot of people's go-to is isopropyl alcohol. It does a pretty good job of getting rid of contamination, and it also evaporates pretty quickly, meaning it's not going to stick around and cause problems. So after a lot of scrubbing, we are left with this. One very clean group of solder joints. That was the only corrosion I found on the amp board, and the only other corrosion I found on any of the other boards was on this one here. I guess all there is to do now is see if this scrubbing actually did anything. The majority of these boards are actually grounded through the chassis of the unit, so this does need to be at least partially assembled in order to do any testing. Not gonna lie though, I was straight up terrified about getting this thing back together. It all seemed so daunting taking all these components apart, but it honestly wasn't that bad once I got down to it. The connectors that need to be plugged in can only be connected to the corresponding one, and besides that, the ribbon cables are pretty much frozen in form, so they naturally want to line up with the right plug anyway. It really wasn't that bad. But okay, let's test this skeleton boy of a radio out. 
and immediately there's a difference. Not in the sound, but in the display. It went from completely dead to completely dying. That's still something, right? There's barely any light coming out of this thing, and it's made even worse when I flip the running lights on. There might be some parasitic draw happening here. I also noticed that one of the three little light bulbs on the display board isn't coming on with the rest of the bulbs. Cool. But the speakers. What about the speakers? Well, let me get out of this giant Faraday cage of a barn and test it out. Hey, I don't want to get this video removed because of copyright issues, but the sound is clear. Neat. But the display in the now known light bulb are still crap, so let's see if something can be done about that. The radio was popped out of the car and stripped completely apart yet again. For the last time, hopefully. Let's take a closer look at this thing. Fixing what should be a pretty simple problem first, I want to tackle the little light bulb issue. The filament inside the bulb is perfectly intact, so it should be lighting up. I did a bit of electrical archaeology and found out that this pin here is the 12 volt input for the little lights that come on. With an Arduino acting as a baby power supply, we can test these lights out. But just like in the car, the right one is not coming on. 99% of tracking down electrical gremlins starts off with checking continuity, making sure that all wires and traces are allowing electricity to flow as intended. From the 12 volt input to the bad bulb, there's a trace that goes all the way around the board to this red wire, and that wire goes to the light bulb on the separate board for the display. With my multimeter set to continuity mode, everything checks out. I thought at this point, oh, maybe it's the ground that's bad, which is shared with the display, so that could be why they're both faulty. But nope. I got out the janky power supply again and tested it right on the solder joints this time. The other light turns on because you can see the glow on the mat, but still nothing here. What if I just check the actual pins directly? Well, would you look at that. It looks like we got ourselves some broken solder joints, boys. And that is an easy fix. I scraped off the rest of the conformal coating around the joints, then reflowed the solder, and also added way too much new solder. It's a globby mess to say the least, but hey, it still should work just fine. Oh yeah, that's very relieving to see. Well, if the light bulb just had some solder joints that were garbage, I'm thinking that it's very possible that the display issue is singing to the same tune. The continuity between the display pins and the corresponding pins on the microchip here seem to check out until the very last pair on this row. Just like any problem child, pressing a hot iron against it is the obvious course of action. Now to just go through the rest of the joints and check for continuity and fix anything if needed. But of course you can't see any of that because my hands are just right in the way. There turned out to be two more bad pairs on this side and two more bad pairs on the bottom half of the display. I will say that more than likely only one of the two solder joints for each of these pairs was bad. Same for the light bulb too, but reflowing both of the solder joints was quick enough and only gave me peace of mind. I posted the display not working over on Instagram, that's at Fingerprints Workshop for the people that close their eyes at the end of my videos, and I got a few messages from people saying they also had issues with the same thing, not even with Delco radios. That just made me more confident that this indeed is going to be the fix. But let's find out. It is together enough. Nice! Look at that! All three lights are on. And I realize that dims. Not because of the parasitic draw, but... 
Because it's nighttime when you put those lights on and you don't need that to be as bright as you do during the day. Besides the display just lighting up, it also functions as it should. But of course setting the time now ultimately does not matter since this thing has to come out at least once more to address the non-functioning tape deck. Here we go. 99% of the time if a tape deck isn't working, it's because the little rubber band, the square cut belt that drives the pulleys that spin the tape, is broken. And my case is no exception. Oh yeah, this belt is all loose. Besides that obvious issue, everything else seems to check out. The mechanisms all move, uh, tape can be popped in and ejected like it's supposed to. The fast forward gearing engages as it should, as well as the reverse gears. So I'm hoping that it just needs a new belt. However, you can't exactly buy a 1985 Pontiac Fiero tape deck square cut belt all willy nilly. Well, at least not without getting more than you need. This assorted pile of tape deck belts was only $8 on Amazon. Considering that this is the only expense necessary in order to fix the radio, not including the three bucks worth of capacitors I ended up not using, that's really not a bad deal. So after finding one that looked to be the right size, I slipped it over the two large capstan pulleys as well as the motor pulley. Assuming that this is the whole problem now fixed, I guess I can go ahead and put the entirety of the radio back together. But uh... Why don't you guys take a quick look at how far the playhead is for this video? Yeah, I guess I got a little overzealous. So I'm missing one screw. Aha! Fell in one of those stupid holes that Harbor Freight decided to put all over this workbench. Are you sure you want holes all over the workbench? It's what the people want! Okay, so there's some audio. That's still a win, right? Maybe third place? The fact that it is playing just very slowly means that there's some friction happening. But that wasn't the only issue. It also got stuck in reverse and wouldn't switch back to forward. This is gonna be the last time that I do this. I am so done. The slow speed could be because the new belt is a little tight, or the more likely scenario, because the car was sitting for over 20 years in a mold and moisture infested environment where grime and rust flourish, all while this mechanism remained frozen, awakening only to be unwilling to operate. Basically said, it needs lubrication. But as any forum post or technical write-up would tell you, a tape deck is not the place to hose everything down. Some parts of this need to be spinning or sliding smoothly and can be a little bit oily, and others need to be bone dry, mainly the parts that actually come in contact with the tape. And here, I'm actually adding oil where there's the metal on metal contact for all the sliding mechanisms. As far as the actual issue for the playback speed goes, that's a problem with the pulleys right there. The main shafts of these pulleys are called the capstans, these guys right here. And they're what drive the wheels that pull the tape across the tape head. And unfortunately, I also got a little overzealous here and didn't notice when my camera shut off. Cool. Basically, I slid the pulleys out with the shafts attached to them, wiped everything down, and added the teeniest bit of oil to them and slid them back in. And that's all it should need for the speed issue. For the reverse issue, that's the result of something wrong with the solenoid for the auto-reverse mechanism. And if you don't know, a solenoid is just a little doohickey that pushes a rod back and forth by means of magnetism. It has many applications in the automotive world, but in this case, it's just to slide some dark magic around. And in case you missed it, the solenoid is getting stuck right at the end just before the arm can move forward. 
Because this is literally just a coil of wire creating a magnetic field, introducing a tiny bit of oil in here isn't gonna interfere with anything. That should hopefully do the trick. Besides just lubricating, I would be remiss not to do a bit of cleaning. Just like before, isopropyl alcohol is the tool for this, but this time, with cotton swabs, I wiped down the playhead, the cap stands, and the little wheels the cap stands drive. So, with that little bit of lubrication and cleaning, I'm hoping that should be enough to get everything working A-OK. -okay. I just watched the edit for the video. Um, you're not gonna use that hollow note song as the montage music for the final assembly, are you? Uh, yeah. Aren't you, uh, aren't you a little bit worried about it getting copyright striked? No, because truthfully, the tape player does work, but it plays about 5% slower than it actually should play. It's not ideal, but because of that, the copyright crawler's not going to detect it, so it'll be okay. So you're absolutely positive it won't. Yeah, 100% positive. Okay, so we're not going to upload the video, find out that we do indeed get a copyright strike hours before we release it early for the peeps on Patreon, and then have to scramble and film something that addresses all this mess. I guess like worst case scenario, we could just use royalty free music for the montage and I guess get one of those cassette to auxiliary adapters and just play something that's not copyrighted. But that is not gonna happen for sure. Saturday projects. I typically upload at a pretty sporadic rate just whenever I have stuff done. I want to put more semi-regular stuff out there so my viewers actually stay engaged in my channel because currently I'm doing a pretty horrible job of that. Yeah, and four years later you still are. While this may not be the most pristine specimen of automotive interiors and definitely not the most desirable of head units, I'm still extremely happy with getting this thing working again. This was something that I think a lot of people would otherwise just chunk into the garbage, but I saved it. Not dissimilar to the whole project car, actually. But I got this radio to play without too much noise, the tape deck works, and honestly, what I'm most happy about, the display functions. It was the last little visual thing needed for this interior to be wrapped up in a nice 1980s bow. And I say it's the last thing for the interior because I already filmed all of the work for the next main episode in the Fiero Restoration series, where a few more things in here had to be addressed, as well as some stuff on the outside. <laughs> I'm interested to see if anyone can spy any of those things. Either way, thank you so much for watching and for sticking around for this project. We're really almost done. So, until next time, I'll see you guys later. <laughs>